The birthplace of the Bohemian Revolution from Cowork 591 Studios. This is the Steve Brown Arts Center Podcast Network with co-host Dale Reber and producer Blake Tempest. I am Jim Gillespie, and this is the Jessup News for July 24th, 2023. On today's podcast, we talk about winners and losers. We talk about uh, upcoming Watermelon Day. It's this coming weekend, everybody. Yep. Missing in Action is a new or is uh, this week's uh, blurb from my blog. We have been doing StoryCorps over in Independence, and we did StoryCorps at Jessup Farmer's Day. We have Dixie Lee Hall. That is going to, we're going to play her story. Okay. Um, we review Mandino's 10 Steps to Success. We look at the events inside of the Steve Brown Arts Center. We give you the top stories in Jessup. We discuss service and arts. And Dale has a couple things special this week. We don't have a guest, but we'd like to thank Mike Farrell Last week, um, believe it or not, that was our 50th podcast oh, of wow. the year, or the 50th podcast ever. ever. Okay, that's, just, okay. Yeah, that's yeah. nice. Now, that includes the concerts, that includes uh, the stories that we did early on, that in- includes a um, story from River Road, mm-hmm. so... But that those that was number fifty. This is fifty one, Dale. I listened to Mike's interview a couple times just in the last couple of days. I was, thought it was very interesting. He's mm-hmm. a very interesting man, and uh, it's like I've said this before. It's amazing to me the people that live in Jessup that have a history like that, or not a job like that, or that you know nothing about until you just happen to run across them, and find out you know these different and wonderful, exciting things that they're doing. Uh, in the history they have, and you have no idea. Yeah, uh, that's but, exactly uh, right. Uh, I had a cousin named Dixie. Do you ever know a girl named Dixie? Or Dixie Linhard in Cresco, okay. Iowa. Okay. For our listeners in Cresco. Okay, it was Dixie Clendenin, but uh, uh, she's the only girl I ever knew named Dixie, and now I know three. So there you yeah, go. Okay, uh, all right. My, my father, I think we talked about this in another podcast, my father was from Clendenin, West Virginia. Mm-hmm. And, uh, E-N or O-N? It D-N. is E-N. Okay. E-N? Yeah. C-L-E-N-D-E-N-E-N? Okay. Yeah. That's the same spelling, so mm-hmm. my, I, I might own part of that town then. You might. Yeah. You so. might. The Empire. What, t- what state? West Virginia. Oh, okay. Yeah. Any place but West Virginia. No. If you, uh, <laughs> if you uh, go to the internet and go to YouTube... You can. Uh, there was a terrible flood in Clendenin. I okay. mean, it, it it almost wiped out the community. Okay. Um, ter- terribly poverty ridden community. Mm-hmm. Well, that sounds like my family. So. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, we we uh, have uh, an updated version uh, from Jill Chemin on what's going on in Buchanan County this coming month and. We talk about the windmills that they're going to build in the southern part of Buchanan County a little bit. There's talking about them, right? Don't get them built yet. There you go. (laughs) There you go. Yep, yep. They're just talking right now, so. They are. They are. So uh, we've got a lot to do. So uh, remember the Steve Brown Art Center is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that has a vision for artists. Young and old alike to have the opportunity to better themselves while helping to build the skills of of those around them. It will be offering community programming starting in Jessup before expanding to neighboring communities. Programming will include a community speaker series that will showcase existing creatives who reside within the community as well as a pop-up series that will spotlight and partner with local businesses to provide opportunities for community engagement. Mm -hmm. Don't forget the long-range version is to have a residency for artists so that they can work on their skill and also Mm. better our community. Right. With that said, let's let's start uh, the episode out, Dale, with winners and losers. Okay. Uh, My winner this week is the National League in baseball. They finally, after X number of years, won the All-Star game. And I've been a National League person for a long time. And it's always amazing to me that if you look on paper, 
the National League always had the better pitchers and the better players, it seemed like, the most known uh, players, the ones with the, with the most fame. And yet year after year after year, they would lose to the American League. And for a while there was an important game because it determined a lot about the World Series, about who started in the World Series, where the World Series first game was. And so, so anyway, I was real happy to see the National League because they might have quit playing if they didn't win sooner or later. I'd, say, I'd yeah. tell you where the All-Star game was almost wrecked is when the commissioner called it a tie that one year. Oh, yeah, yeah. Would well, you remember when they used to have two every year? I don't remember okay, that. Way back no. when they des- they tried that, and I don't. It didn't last very long, but they decided to have two because they could make twice as much money. So, right. But right. Uh, that didn't didn't go very well. So uh, they, they, they've done a nice job of making it a jewel event with the home run. Yeah. Home yeah. run derby the day before yeah. and stuff like that. It used to be just the game. Mm-hmm. The game was uh, usually on Saturday. I think it was on Saturday. Saturday during the day, and uh, it was a big deal. You would just see Mickey Mantle and Stan Musial and Ted Williams and players like that. Yeah. All in one. It was just very exciting. Willie Mays, I mean, some of the greatest players ever uh, playing in the All-Star game and uh, uh, playing to win. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, see Pete Rose run over that catcher. Mm-hmm. I mean. Uh, Ray Fossey, right? Yeah, Ray Fossey, yeah. And uh, so they played for keeps. That's the only way they knew how to play. Mm-hmm. And uh they, it was not an exhibition game for them. It was it was dead serious. Yes, so, yes. Uh, they played to win. Um, so my winner is a logo man, um, my friend and board member, Dean Youngblood. Um, Dean Youngblood has been hired as the new principal at Nashville Playing Field. Okay, Congrats. well, good for him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dean. You went over to the dark side. Is this his it, first principalship? Or? It's his first principalship. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm real happy for him. I, I am too. So he's I, a what, nice guy. I Just, ran into hmm. Dean the day that uh, he received the job, and he had the biggest grin on his face. Yeah. I was so happy for yeah. him. His contract is unique. Um his contract doesn't start until August 1st. Okay. So. He'll uh, have to hit the ground running, won't he? He that's will. Not much, uh, much time. Yeah. No, my, my son is about the same age as Dean and his brother. Yeah. And so they played Little League baseball and basketball, the youth programs. And you always, those young blood boys were very good at everything they did. And so it was always bad when you played their team. You knew you were in for a struggle. And right. I don't recall that they were ever on our team. <laughs> they were always on somebody else's team. And so, but uh, very good players and, and nice kids, uh, really good guys. So, Well, if I remember right, Dean was a catcher and your son Chris was a catcher as yeah. well. Mm-hmm. So I'm yeah. sure they, they tried to keep them apart so they both could catch. Well, I don't know. It's interesting to see people play games like that when they're younger and then as they grow older they have success and you know part of it is because of some of the training and and instruction they got when they were young people uh, playing on a team and and playing for the most part uh, the the, more volunteer dads for the that coached and and pretty much good guys and uh, not in it for their own ego or for their kids ego but just to, to try to help out and help teach kids the gamers and so uh, I felt real good about my son's experience going out through through school and playing oh, those good. youth games, so good, yeah, and he's a wonderful guy now, so it must have worked for him. Too, so. <laughs> so, and who's your loser then? Oh, my loser, Pat Fitzgerald, uh, is the uh, ex-football coach of Northwestern. For the past several years, Northwestern and the Iowa Hawkeyes have had a real battle on the football field, and I think it's like six to five over the last 10, 11 mm-hmm. years, be eleven years, and uh, but apparently there's a lot of hazing going on on the Northwestern team and things going on uh, that he should have been aware of. He says he is not. He was had no idea, but uh, it was his team, and so he has been fired from his coaching job at Northwestern University, which I'm sure had to be a multi-million dollar job anyway. And so it's a big loss for him, but it also uh, I think uh, it kind of shows the world the football world that the the culture is driven by the coach and the coach is responsible and uh you know this we can't have this crap going on right you know all that uh uh that hazing that's uh very traumatic and they have a lot of people standing up now and talking about what happened to them and uh so i'm i'm uh if all of it is true, I it uh, I am I'm glad to see him go. Uh, my my loser is 
Senator Tommy Tuberville from Alabama. He, Tommy Tuberville, for those of you sports fans, was the head coach at Auburn. I believe he was the head coach there when they won the national championship. I, I think you're right. Yeah. And um, he, He's a senator now? He is a senator. Oh, okay. I did not yep. know that. So. Yeah, and he is holding up the military budget. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, because in the military budget, they are allowing females to cross state lines to have abortions, mm-hmm. and they're they're paying for their gas. Yeah. And Tuberville isn't the only one that is yelling about it, but he's the one holding up the military budget. Yeah. So you know, and and. It is. It is uh, almost almost all of these, and you've mentioned this time and again, Dale. Almost all of these, it is men doing actions against women. Yeah, well, it seems that's what it seems like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there are women involved, obviously. Yeah. In, there are there are women in the Senate and the House, but but anyhow, he is my loser for the week. Yeah. The main is that he's holding up promotions for a lot of high-ranking officers. And so things are slowing down in the Defense Department because there's nobody to fill that chair. And the guy whose term is up, like in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, you can only serve so long and then you have to leave. Yep. And so now there's nobody there because this other man doesn't have the rank to move up to that spot. And so uh, he's holding up a lot of stuff. And I'm not sure this is the way to get things done. And it, this has happened before, and it gripes me no end that one person can clog up the Senate like that mm-hmm. and just stop everything. I know Grassley has done it before with different things, and uh, I just don't think that's democracy in action when one right. person can hold up everything. Right. Uh, but it's a longstanding tradition in the Senate. So, um, before we uh, before we go to your your segment going on in the upcoming month in <clears throat> Buchanan County is Littleton's first ever Watermelon Day, July 29th, from 12 until 8. Brandon Days, that's plural, is August 4th and 5th. Lamont Days is also August 4th and 5th. Stanley's Fireman Ice Cream Social is August 5th. Meet Me on Main in Independence is August 11th. The Kwaski Car Show is August 19th. Working on the Railroad Worker Appreciation at the Depot, August 19th. The Underground City in Independence is August 19th. The Independence Brew BQ and Duck Derby is August 26th. And the Rash Ride is August 26th. So that's from New Tourism Director of Buchanan County, Jill Chemin. Jill was on our show about three weeks ago. Okay. And so... Is Raleigh Days on there? Or? Um, Raleigh Days, no, it's not. Okay, because they're having an author that grew up in Raleigh. I think now Raleigh's again. in Lynn County. Oh, is it really? I think so. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe that's why. Yeah. But, uh, I okay, think. there's a reason why I want to... This author has a book that I would like to read. Ah. But I, for the life of me, I can't remember what it is now. But uh, he's signing books... And uh, it's a topic that I'm interested in, and so I figure what that is. But, right. Uh, right. There's a paper over there. If we take a break, I'll look it up and yes, tell, tell yes. the people what it is. So. All right. But with that said, um, Dale, you have a segment on 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 woke here. I believe. Well, I'm going to do third party. Are you going to do the third, third party, party yeah. first? Okay. Just we ease it. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. Uh, this past week. Uh, Senator Joe Manchin, a Democrat from West Virginia, and a former Utah Governor Jim Huntsman, a Republican, have uh, founded a group called No Labels, and they are a bipartisan organization aiming to add a third-party candidate to the ballot in all 50 states for the next presidential election. And they held their first town hall meeting, I think, a week ago, or be this just past Monday, in New Hampshire. And some of the things they're looking for is they want to stop the part- partisanship and incivility and ref- refuse to compromise that dis- dis- <laughs> that divides our country and disables our government. So they're trying to stop that. They want to embrace centrist policies. The parties 
Now the Democrats and Republicans are too far left and too far right. They need to come to the center. Their greatest fear is the national debt. They think that's what's going to bring the country down if we don't get a handle on that. Uh, that people in this country need to learn to believe the facts and accept them, and that when the race is over and the people have spoken, uh, you move on. That's democracy, the orderly transfer of power. I think this is more to do with, with guns than anything, but they were saying that we need to put more money into mental health, that insurance policies are big with money for physical health, but not putting nearly as much as they need to into mental health problems. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, something they're really looking at. And so I looked at uh, third-party candidates uh, from these are the ones since I've been around. And do you remember Ralph Nader? Yep. Unsafe at any speed, he wrote a book. And yep. I, I heard him speak, actually, at a controversial speakers program at UNI when I was there. And so I heard him speak. And uh, that would have been, boy, in the 70s. But in 2000, he ran for the Green Party. And he took enough votes away that uh, Al Gore lost that election, which you think about those things, that changes the course of history when these things happen. And then in 1992, uh, Ross Perot... Uh, ran, and he spoiled the election for George H.W. Bush, and he allowed Bill Clinton to win the presidency with only 43% of the popular vote. In uh, 1980, John Anderson, you remember him? Yeah. Had the white hair? Yeah. Yeah, I liked him. Uh, he got more than 6% of the popular vote, and that was enough to deny, to deny Jimmy Carter a second term. In 1968, George Wallace uh, uh, he was the governor of Alabama, right? Yep. And uh, a big segregationist, and he ran for president, and he took so many votes. This was 68 when Johnson, the Democrat, decided he would not run. And so uh, now I can't remember who did run for the Democrats that year. Um, that, that was Hubert Humphrey. Hubert Humphrey, okay. Mm -hmm. You're right. And so, but Wallace took away enough votes that Richard Nixon, the Republican, won the election. And so the evidence they say, is that a strong third-party candidate is bad news for the sitting president, almost always. They say these third-party candidates, they poll really high at the very beginning and when things are just getting started, but when it gets time to vote, people go in there and they vote for their Republican or their Democrat like they always have. And so uh, the person has a lot of energy, but it's not really there at the end when you have to make your X in the, in the box. Mm -hmm. And so, so there's another group now then that's formed because this group formed. It's called Citizens to Save Our Republic, and they are led by former House of Representatives Democratic leader uh, Dick Gephardt. And they are opposing the efforts of no labels, and they hope to convince them not to be a factor in the election, as they believe that would mean a victory for Trump. If, they, if this no labels group gets really active and strong, they think it's going to suck votes away from uh, President Biden and that Trump would win again, because the Trump people are going to vote for Trump no matter what. Mm -hmm. They are not going to be convinced one way or the other to vote against him. Uh, even the uh, Republican candidates are having a hard time getting any momentum right now because uh, the Trump supporters are so very, very strong. So I guess I was not my job to urge people, but if you're thinking about these third-party candidates, uh, they need to have lots and lots and lots of support, you know, 50, 60, 70 percent polling, I think, before you could really uh, trust them to perhaps win the election and, and change things. Uh, it doesn't seem like, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but uh, a lot of times what it does is it puts a person in that you don't really want in and they win the election and then uh, you're stuck with them for at least four years. So, uh, so anyway, that's, that's coming up. You'll see more about this, these two parties or these two groups, I guess, not really parties. And uh, whether this uh, Joe Manchin, he has run for president before, and didn't do very well, but uh, uh, a lot of people are thinking this is a mechanism for him to get back into the race and run for president again. But uh, uh, A candidate that I supported for the Democrats in the last election, um, Andrew Yang, has started a third party, the Forward Party. Oh, is that right? Okay. And uh, he, he, you know, he's had a number of lieutenants that have run some have won, mm -hmm. some have lost. You know, a lot of won local, local races, and I, I really believe those of you that want to get involved in politics, you know, you can get your start in local races. Yeah. Well, I think George Wallace, I think, is the only one of all these third-party candidates. One, he won one electoral vote, 
The rest of them never even got one. Mm-hmm. And so all they do is spoil things. And even uh, the election where uh, Trump won against Hillary Clinton, there were a couple people that ran that didn't get a lot of votes, but they got enough that may have swung that election. Because all you need to do is, is win the electoral vote. You don't need to win the popular vote. And so it was enough to swing the vote and so allow Trump to win. So you don't want to be a spoiler. If you have a legitimate chance, I think that's fine. Run for it. But uh, if all you're doing is being a spoiler, then I think you need to think twice about what you're doing for the country. So. Well, who is it uh, that's running the Democrats? Is it Bobby Kennedy Jr.? Yeah. Um, yeah. That is running... Actually, right. he, yeah, he's not polling much. He's, no. uh, he seems to be a strange little man just from what I've heard about yeah. him. But, uh, <laughs> All right. Well, that Massachusetts inbreeding or something. But, yeah. oh, okay. All right, yeah. All right. So anyway, that was uh, something I read about, and uh, I guess it's never too early to start thinking about these kind of things because uh, they're up and running, and uh, we need to be aware. Okay, well, well uh, thank you, Dale. The uh, next thing we want to talk about before we get too far is Watermelon Day in Littleton this week. Right. Uh, we are we're excited as well as appre- apprehensive <laughs> um, and, and have anxiety about yeah. that. Uh, well, before I'm, I'm, I have two grandsons coming this week, this next, and so this week, and. Uh, we're coming. We're going to Honey Creek most of the week, but we're coming back on Friday so we can go to Watermelon Days on Saturday. Ah, so right. if you got something for a ten-year-old and an eight-year-old, why they'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the music, the music yeah. and the food and a yeah. couple artists. Yeah, there. that's what I'm hoping. That, but uh, yeah, so you'll have four there anyway. Oh, so. good. Well, well, the over and under. The over and under <laughs> is the and remember as we talk about gambling on our show here. Yes, it, it is. It is for. Entertainment porpoises only, Dale. <laughs> yeah. and gambling is terrible. It's, it's a very terrible. Story. It is, and yeah. it's illegal. It's illegal for me to do it. So, <laughs> it's, remember, it's entertainment porpoises. Yeah. yeah. But the the gamblers have the over and under at two hundred and fifty people. Okay. So, so Dale, what's your <laughs> prediction? Will there be over two hundred and fifty at the at the Littleton Free Watermelon uh. Day? I well, realistically, I hope there are, but realistically, I don't think there'll be over two fifty. I ha- I had lunch at lo- the local uh, watering ground and cheeseburger supplier um, Littleton Lounge today. Uh-huh. Um, we taped this, remember, mm-hmm. on on the uh, Wednesday prior to Monday, and I ran into just some <clears throat> um, favorite Ray Zumach. Okay. And I told Ray that we were uh, insured for 250 people. He said that there's going to be way over 250 oh, okay. people. So Ray predicts okay. over 250. Well, he's hardly ever wrong, is he? Oh, uh, yeah, so. the I I will not <clears throat> I will not make that statement on here. <laughs> uh, but I I do <clears throat> hope that there's over 250, Dale. Yeah, that would that would be real exciting. Yeah. I have to say I I'm not a regular at the, the Littleton Lounge, but. Uh, a few years ago, I was driving by there, and I had two grandkids. We were going fishing. They both had forgotten water, mm-hmm. and it was a very hot day. So we stopped in Littleton. We were going through there, and I went in there to see if I, I said, a former student of mine, and I can't remember his name right now, was in, oh, Mr. River. I said, yeah, I said, can I have some water? I need a couple of bottles of water for my grand. Oh, sure. And he grabbed him out, and he didn't take any money for him or oh, anything. Cool. He just was just so very nice to me. And so uh, that's my endorsement of the Littleton Lounge is that, that – uh, uh, when I was in there, the people were really, really nice and very accommodating and helped me out a great deal. So I would recommend it to anybody. Yeah. So. Bob's done a nice job with it, um, a great job with it, actually. Don't forget, there's there's uh, the Bad Habits Band. There is, there is uh, Reagan and McCleary, mm-hmm. and there is Powers and Bants. Yeah. Um, all three of those, we have... Um, a real famous artist that is painting a picture that day, uh, Barb Prowl, and we talked about actually making prints okay. of that. That would be nice. So, so we will probably do that. She sells her work, right? I yeah, she regularly. sells her yeah. work okay. right now. There's, it's fifty percent off if you go online. She has some amazing art. Okay, we we have um, some some. Uh, 
We have Boyd's Food Truck, the best che- cheese curds in the world. <laughs> okay. And the rolled ice cream guy is going to be there. And the rolled ice cream yeah. guy is going to be there. And the Jessup Lions, Lions. as well. Yeah. So please support all three of those. And Have you got your watermelon supply secured? Or? We, we are. I was dealing with that today. Um, how many do you believe a one watermelon <laughs> feeds? <laughs> what is this? Okay. Uh, a regular size watermelon. A 20 pound watermelon. Yeah. A what, four? Uh, it is, they say six. Six. Okay. They say six. Yeah. So we're, we are getting, we're going <clears throat> with 30 watermelon. So that'll feed 180. Hopefully, like, like um, board member Alex Relos said, we can always send somebody to the grocery <laughs> store in a hurry if we yeah, need to. So, uh, I remember eating watermelon, and uh, my room was upstairs, and the bathroom was downstairs, of course. And we'd just stuff ourselves with watermelon yeah. and your stomach hurts. And then all night long, I mean, every, <laughs> it seemed like every hour down to the bathroom. Yeah. Right about, it just really, uh, there's a lot of water in those watermelon, but... Uh, I love ice cold water, but I just think it's one of the greatest foods there is. So. Oh, what, what is it like? Eighty percent is water. I, I believe. bet. Yeah, yeah, it's gotta yeah. be. It's gotta be. Yep. Uh, but anyhow, that is this weekend from noon until eight. Please. See, we've been talking about it forever, and now it's here. It yeah, is. Yeah. I know it. I know it. Yeah. This week in library news, a little to- tot story time meets every Thursday at ten thirty for song stories and more. The Spice Club. Is finally uh, still the is still deal. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't make that up. I'm a, I'm quite <laughs> the poet. Um, Monday movie <laughs> champions. Don't don't forget that's with uh, um, Woody Harrelson. Yeah, watch the language in that one. Yep. Local author Shar Raruda is there um, this Thursday at six thirty. Shar will join us to read from her book Puffy Hair Everywhere. And to talk about her inspiration, right? Mega phone blast. Her party is Sunday, July thirtieth, from one to three at the Riverwalk Park in Independence. Playing mountains of foam. It's non-toxic and non-staining. Wear a swimsuit or clothes that can get wet, and bring along a towel and goggles for all families in Buchanan County. Fontana Critters. What did uh, they get? What's that? Did they get a new one? Um, say goodbye to our July critter, the Salazar, the sal- salamander. Salamander. Uh, and help us welcome a new, a new Fontana friend for the month of August. They didn't say okay. yet, so it's well. Maybe he's not there yet. You know, uh, Dale, I have a salamander in my garden at home. Do you really? I do it. Okay. Honest to goodness, I didn't know what it was. It was so fast. Yeah, I they, they eat bugs, right? They're not. They're going to eat your green beans or anything. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. No, very interesting little animal. They're mm-hmm. quick. Yes, yeah, they just, are. Yeah. Um, the Fontan- um, There's 1,000 Books Before Kindergarten program at the JPL is designed to be simple and encourage making reading a daily habit. We are looking for more partners to support the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. This free program provides monthly books for children aged 0 to 5 years living in the Jessup School District. This service is locally funded, and we are grateful for those who are already our sponsor. Um, those sponsors include Heartland Technology, Innovative Wealth Management, Jessup Paint and Auto Body, Jessup Chamber of Commerce, and the JPL Endowment Fund. If your business would like to partner with us, please contact the library. Do you get those Japanese beetles in your garden? Mm-hmm. I, I've been watching for them in just the last couple of days. They've got in my bushes and stuff. and so Okay. Uh, need to have them sprayed or something because they really... Eat a lot of leaves. And they get after. Oh, they're, they're they? terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Are they from Japan? Do you think? Oh, uh, I, I have no idea what, how they <laughs> how they got here. Yeah. But, okay. But uh, okay. <laughs> I hate to ask these hard questions. Yeah, so I shouldn't yeah. have done that. So. That's all right. That's all right. Um, as I said, we've been doing StoryCorps for the last couple of months, and. We, we did it at Farmer's Day. We've been doing it at the Farmer's Market over in Independence. And I did a moving one this past Saturday. Uh, it was a 85-year-old lady by the name of Dixie Lee Hull. Dixie lost her second husband recently, 
and she wanted to talk about him. Mm-hmm. And so we would like you to listen to Dixie Lee Hall as she talks about her second husband. Listen now. This is the Steve Brown Arts Center Podcast Network. I am with Dixie Lee Hall. She's 85 years old, and today's date is July 15th, 2023. I am, my name is Jim Gillespie, and I am recording this interview in Independence, Iowa. Dixie, when and where were you born? Montezuma, Iowa. And where did you grow up? In Barn City, Iowa. It's okay. a really small town. All right. What was it like? Uh, it was trying at times. Uh, my mother and father were divorced, and my dad remarried, and then he had three children, so I had three half one half brother and two half sisters. Okay. Um, who were your parents, Dixie? Um, Carl Bailey Evans. Uh, that was my pop, my dad. And uh, what was the other question? Uh, um, who were your parents? Yeah, and then Mildred Scott, and that was her maiden name. But she was married more than once, so I I lo- I didn't really know her growing up. Okay, and. Your siblings, what were they like growing up? Uh, there, there wasn't any growing up with me. Uh, my dad's wife, uh, she had three children, a boy and two girls. And uh, I had my daughter look it up on her, whatever that, I get a nod up with all this new technology. Yes. But I said, see if you can find a Douglas Evans, Carl Douglas Evans. Uh-huh. His first name was the same as his dad. How are you? How are you doing? And um, Mr. Iowa you might have to help me because sometimes I lose my train of thought. Right. <laughs> so, uh, and then uh, that was about it. I didn't have any children around me except at school. Okay, all right. Um, neat. So, so Dixie. You you were you were married twice. Um, tell us about your uh, relationship with your second husband. Okay, uh, his name was Gerald Anthony Hole, and uh, he was married before. And his wife just wanted to trip out east, and, and then so she kind of dropped it, and so then they finally got a divorce. And. Uh, he was, he was in the Navy, but he never left dry land, and he wanted to be on a ship. And so he, he said that uh, he filled out the form that they gave him, and he said uh, there was only, there, I'm not, he was lacking one. He didn't fill that one. And he said, well, put hospital form, and you'll never get it. And, of course, that's what he got. Ah. So he never got out. On the, he had two cousins who were in the Navy, and so he was hoping to get it but it didn't work out that way. But I told him that he didn't know how blessed he was because he didn't have to kill anybody. He helped heal people. Very good, yes. I love that, Dixie. What uh, did your husband mean to you, Dixie? Everything, but not before God. Oh, good answer. Uh, Dixie, are you comfortable, or can you talk about your husband's death and how he died? Uh, he had the beginnings of dementia, and uh, but he was still doing uh, word finds and uh, crossword puzzles, and he did a lot of reading. So he just had the very beginnings of it. And uh, but he had had some trouble before that with his eyes rolling back in his head, and he couldn't figure out what that was. So uh, a year or two before that, he was in Independence Hospital, and then they took him to Iowa City. But they didn't find anything, so then they sent him home. And uh, he, he was in the bathroom. He went in the bathroom, and I thought I heard him call me. So I went in, and I said, did you call me? He said, I feel weird. And like if you snap your fingers, he was gone. Oh, wow. Died that quick. That quick. Uh, what has been the hardest thing about losing your husband, Dixie? because he was always telling me he loved me and I miss his hugs. Oh, that's that's so nice. 
In fact, uh, even when he was having the dementia, he he was kind of a per perfectionist. <coughs> and so if he dropped something or something, he, would, he was more irritated than he should have been. You know? Oh, cool. So, uh, that's right. <laughs> I kind of lost my train of thought again. <laughs> oh, you've done well. What uh, what did your husband look like, Dixie? Well, he was short. I've got some pants of his that I've uh, been trying to find somebody to that could wear them because they were only at 30. Oh, okay. And uh, he was uh, boots. He had several pairs of boots, and they were size 8, so they were hard to move to. And uh, he was... He was starting to bald, and uh, he had uh, he had a beard and a mustache, but he kept it trimmed. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it was uh, it wasn't all over his face. I don't know how else to say it. So, but he was he was a nice guy, and and I could trust him. How uh, how are you different now, Dixie, than than you were before you lost your husband? Malone, a lot. My daughter, both of them live here. One, the older one, I don't see as often, but she takes me to the eye doctor because I have macular degeneration. Mm -hmm. And uh, my youngest daughter, my, I have a son that lives in Colorado. He's retired. And my daughter's retired because she worked at, can I give a brand name? Sure. Fairway for 35 years. And so her legs were pretty much ruined. So yes, she has a lot of trouble with her legs. And Julie was a littlest, and when I got married to my second husband, she was about six. And uh, so, uh, no, I forgot the question. Oh, no, what do you, you look you, like? You, okay. No, no, you've done well, Dixie. Um, is there an image of your husband that persists to you, Dixie? Well, I'm not quite sure what you mean, but I have a picture of he and I together in my living room, and I have a picture of him alone. And I have, he was cremated, and I have the, the container, and so I feel like sometimes when I go by, I lay my hand on it and say, I love you, or good morning. Or, and so I don't, I bought a stone, and they put it in, and his name is on it. And, he would, they put it, we didn't have a military thing, we uh -huh. could have, but we wanted to keep it as simple as that. And we didn't have a viewing, we just had the funeral. And uh, so uh, I just miss him. Uh, he died uh, November 20th of 21. So it's been a little while, but it's getting better. We had to move. My daughter said, Mom, it's time you move back to Independence because we couldn't find a house with the, or they were all really, really high. Right. In Independence, but in Owine, they were a lot cheaper. Uh -huh. And so we got a really beautiful home and we put new siding on it. We put uh, new cement in it. We put a new steel roof on it. We, and then Julie said, Mom, it's time to move back. And so uh, we did. And I hated the house at first. But I'm getting to where I love it. Now. Oh, good, good. Well, well, thank you so much, Dixie, for this interview. Wasn't that wonderful? The, the that that interview was one of my favorite interviews. Yeah. Dale of StoryCorps. This week's cuts on from the My Life in the Amish Air Force blog that that I've done the last. 13 years, wow, mm -hmm. uh, is called Missing in Action. If you want your heart squeezed, go to YouTube and type Waltzing Matilda, the Tom Waits version. Totally out of this world. He's a, he is a veteran of the Army Civil War, missing in action because of his own accord. He has the ability to endear himself to anyone. A brilliant, brilliant writer, singer, and artist. Did you know, Dale, that Tom Waits is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? I did not know that. So. Yep, yep. Um, somebody asked him how he got his voice, and he said he got it by screaming into his pillow. No. <laughs> so. What's his, he has a big song. 
Uh, he's got well, he, lots of them. He's got lots of songs. Waltzing, Waltzing Matilda, the train song was one. Uh, he he he's got many songs, but he was on both Toy Stories as well. He was a voice okay. on both Toy Stories. Okay. Kids kids recognize his voice in that. Um, I used to play his music in class. And they'd say, oh, that's a guy in Toy Story. Oh, okay, that's kind of neat. But yeah. He must have been after 1975 because that's the last time I listened to popular yeah. music. So. Um, Wade has a great quote. If you get far enough away, you'll be on your way back. It seems all my life I've been running from something. My mom and dad asked me as long as they were alive why I was always running. I could never answer that question. Perhaps now that I'm... Almost 63, I have some clue. My dad was a truck driver, gone weeks at a time in every state but Alaska and Hawaii. I know I wanted to travel like him. Few people knew that dad was a professional athlete, a Pro Bowl rider. He was bucked off one Saturday night and broke both of his arms, and that put an end to that career. My mother was the hardest working human I've ever been around. It, working the 11 to 7 shifts in a rest home or working in a can redemption center, she knew nothing but working as hard as she could every minute of every day. Then she would come home and do the housework inside and out. Both my mother and father had an 8th grade education, but we never wanted. They were incredible. Dad would bring home his paycheck on Friday night, and Mom would give him $25 to live on the road for the next week. As a young man, I always said to myself, nobody will ever control my money but me. It took me years to realize my mom was incredible at managing money, and Dad knew it. Dad and Mom never had a credit card. They fought to stay out of debt. A true family history. My father was the son of a horse trader in West Virginia, and my mom was the daughter of a horse thief on the Iowa-Minnesota border. On Dad's right arm, just behind his bicep, he had a long scar. I can remember as a young boy asking what happened, and he told me his father had a horse, and it bit him, and they were 30 miles from the doctor and 19 miles from the vet. You have heard doctors called old, old horse doctors. Today's doctors should leave such, such little of a scar for such a bad bite. Mm -hmm. My dad grew up with tobacco farmers all around him. He chewed mail pouch, loose leaf, Smoked El Producto cigars, rolled his own cigarettes, and smoked a pipe now and again, and dipped snuff. He died of a heart attack on my birthday my senior year in high school. Combine all of that nicotine with all the fried food he loved to eat, and it was inevitable. At the end, he was one of the greatest heroes. This is the Steve Brown Art Center Podcast Network. In Hazleton, there was an old man that lived by himself in a house. Uh, near the hill where we went sledding. Was, Earl Rice was his name. And as a little kid, I would go visit him and talk with him and just how you, you could do that in those days and not worry about it. But he chewed a tobacco called Peachy Crap was the name of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget that. And uh, he'd have this big cut in his mouth and he would throw it on the ground. He had a dog named Dewey and then the dog would eat that. Uh -huh. And yeah, that dog will never have worms, he said. <laughs> <laughs> but just the nicest old man, and uh, I, don't, I don't just how you have those relationships when you're younger. Sometimes right. an older person that means a lot to you. This this week's obituaries are sponsored by White Funeral Home. We only have one: um, a tragedy. Nicole Marie Ambrose Hovey, 43 years old of Jessup, Iowa, died Saturday, July 8th at Indiana University Health and University Hospital in Indianapolis, Indiana. Services are, were pending at White Funeral Home. Nicole was born December 17, 1979 in Waverly, Iowa, the daughter of Todd Allen Ambrose and Linda Lee Ambrose. She graduated from East High School in Waterloo, Iowa with a class of 1998. She continued her education at the University of Northern Iowa studying criminal justice. In 2009, she and Casey Lee Hovey shared vows in Gilbertville, Iowa. Nicole was a dedicated mother, enjoyed others, and an inspir inspiration to be around. 
She was greatly loved and will be greatly missed. Mm. Nicole is survived by her husband, Casey Hovey of Jessup, one young son, Carson Hovey, her parents, Todd and Linda Ambrose of Elk Run Heights, her paternal grandmother, Shirley Ambrose of Waverly, two brothers, Ryan Ambrose of Waterloo, Scott Ambrose of Waterloo, one niece, Jersey Ambrose, and two nephews, Mason and Keegan Ambrose. Her her paternal grandfather, Gary Ambrose, and maternal grandparents, Dean and Marge Salo, preceded her in death. This is the Steve Brown Art Center Podcast Network. If you uh, don't get a chance to get down to co-work and eat at the food trucks, Mm -hmm. do that. They, They have some great opportunities. Today they are having... The Caribbean Kitchen from 11 till 2. Okay. For those of you that are early listener, they have the Burrito Express tomorrow the 25th from 11 till 7. It's amazing, Dale, how many food trucks are out there. Yeah, I, I have been. Because when they first started coming here, I just was amazed that there'd be a different one all the time. And uh, it's, it's quite a thing. Uh, and how many people... Uh, graduate from food truck to a, a brick restaurant mm-hmm. at some time or another that they, I guess they make enough money, they get enough people following them that they're able to open their own restaurant. And so, but uh, yeah, uh, I guess I never would have dreamed that you could fill a pickup truck <laughs> full of enough, mach- you know, like stoves and refrigerators and that sort of thing that you could actually uh, put out a meal. But it's really quite amazing. Yes, and it is. They're all a little bit different. Yes, yes, it is. Dale, uh, the, the, there is uh, talk of windmills down in the southern part of the county, down mm-hmm. toward Brandon. Yeah. And I know it's this coming, or uh, this past Saturday, this, remember this goes on air the Monday after the weekend, but I know this past Saturday that they had a meeting, the, the Buchanan County Supervisors, the people that are building the windmills allowed people to come in and speak about the thoughts of the windmill. Mm-hmm. It is a great financial opportunity for the people that own the land where they build the windmills, where they put the windmills on. It would be hard to say no to those. Yeah. I don't know the exact yeah. amount, but it's it's a good chunk of change. It's a every good year. check. And there was someone in uh, Franklin County where they have a lot of windmills. Uh, south of Hampton there. And he said, that's money that comes in every year. He can depend on that. Mm-hmm. He says, the rest of your farming, you can't. It may come, it may not. Right. But that, that check is there. Uh, I don't think it's paid once a year or whenever, but uh, he said, that's always money that he can count on. And so for him, it was a very good deal. It, it kept him afloat. So it will, be, it will be interesting to see if these windmills get, get um, built, mm-hmm. um, yeah. Dale. So, you know, I, I know there, there are the positives and negatives on both sides mm-hmm. for, yeah. for having them. Yeah. I was always a big lover of windmills. Here's, you know, clean energy uh, from the wind. It's basically free because the wind is moving. But then I uh, was reading a novel that was taking place in Wyoming, and they had the windmills, and they talked about they could kill each windmill could kill X number of eagles every year without penalty. Mm-hmm. But after that, there was some kind of a penalty that had to be paid. And uh, I had never thought about uh, what those things could do to birds right. flying. And so uh, that bothers me a lot, that they, you know, killing eagles and that sort of thing. But then uh, this is one of those cases where you have to weigh the greater good because I like to see all these... Uh, engines that are putting fumes up in the air and if you have been a fan I don't know this smoke filled clouds so just kind of a warning this is what the world could look like if we don't start doing something about getting rid of, of uh, all the fossil fuels right and so uh, I'm not I'm not sure I, I, I guess uh, I like to see I have electric panels I think they're great and I, I think windmills are great because they make clean uh, electricity versus the fossil fuels. And I think we'll always need the fossil fuels in some form because uh, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine, and you need those there. But I don't think we need, I think if they are under 10% of the energy, that would be great. Uh, that would really help us out a lot. And so uh, 
Anyway, I heard the Chinese are getting real. Uh, this is off topic, I guess, now, but the Chinese are real big into electric cars. They're going to be leading the world in the making of electric cars. Mm -hmm. And they're going all over the world except uh, the United States because Trump put that 25% tariff on them uh, way back when. And so we're not getting many Chinese electric cars, but they are, uh, the rest of the world, a lot of them are buying Chinese cars. And they are uh, one of the biggest automakers in the world now. Okay, interesting. So you're going to go to the meeting? Um, that is the 23rd. I, I, w I will have to... I don't have my calendar handy. Good yeah. question. Okay, well, Bill. I just was one. Yeah. I, I'm kind of interested in it, but I'm, I'm afraid it's uh, going to be a lot of shouting, I guess. I don't, uh, and the, I don't like those kind of meetings. But uh, it, it's, uh, I don't know, I just uh, have a feeling there's a lot of people opposed to this. You see a lot of signs up yeah. with no windmills uh, and, you know, crossed out. And so uh, the, this meeting has, you can speak one time. So let's say you and I went. You could speak one time for three minutes, mm -hmm. and I could speak one time for three minutes, and that's it. Yeah. So, you know, you'll have to be, they'll have to be real organized if they want to stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. So. Republicans are real. Uh, <laughs> it's hard for Republicans to say no to businesses wanting to do mm -hmm. something. And uh, I'm reading a book about uh, Franklin Roosevelt right now, and he as the war was getting ready to start. He had all these big business executives working for a dollar a year. They came in and just volunteering for a dollar a year. And he had a meeting of this one commission, and he said they all were Republicans. And he said, how come all there's all Republicans in this committee? And he said, well, there aren't any Democrats that can afford to work for a dollar a year. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> all right. Now, also, also in Jessup News, they... I believe have 60, the, the contract for North Street has come in. Okay. And so they have 60 days to go from the golf course out there, from, from Blackhawk Buchanan Avenue okay. um, to, to Main Street, the, okay. the, four, the four corner stop signs there. Okay. okay. So 60, 60 days, which doesn't seem like a lot. Well, they should be ready, you would think. Yeah. yeah. Yes, so. yes. I have news, too. The Farmer's Day next year will be June 2021 20, and 22. And so the reason for that is? Is the carnival. We can get to carnival then. Okay. And so uh, we are moving, I think, just the one year, yep. as far as I know. Uh, but so it'll be June 20, 21, and 22 next year. So it'll be nice and early. So uh, those of you planning weddings, yeah. June 20, 21, 22. Yeah. Uh, it's Farmer's Day. Yeah. Well, you have a lot of people at your wedding if you wanted to. And so, uh, make sure you wear the right kind of tuxedo, right? There so, you go. Yeah, but, yeah uh, that's nice. It's out nice and early so people can plan uh, you know, class reunions and that sort of thing. And so, We don't have a theme yet, so we can't start building floats, but you can be collecting your, your materials, I guess. So. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you for that news, Dale. That's all right. I'm just full of it, you know. Yeah. They, that's what that's what that's Dove what says. Heard, right? That's yeah. what Dove says. Um, so, so Dale, yeah, you had a you had a second thing you want to talk about tonight. Oh. Um, what was that? It's called woke, okay. and uh, I was interested because uh, uh, Governor DeSantos, Ron DeSantos, is talks about woke and how he's kicked woke out of Florida. And I thought, okay, I'm not sure what what that is, and so. Uh, I asked someone, and they told me, but it didn't make any sense to me. And so, so I looked it up and, and did a little bit of reading. And, uh, mainly it comes from, uh, uh, it's derived from an African-American uh, vernacular. And uh, there was a, a singer named, his uh, stage name was Lead Belly. You ever heard of him? Yep. And uh, there was an incident in Alabama where they're called the Scottsboro Boys, where nine black teenagers and young men were falsely accused of raping two white women and about the trial. And uh, there were no blacks allowed on the jury. And the, the, the defense team was a couple of lawyers who were not criminal lawyers at all. One was a real estate lawyer. And uh, the judge was prejudiced. Uh, the whole thing was running. It was just a sham. And so they were found guilty. And in those days, uh, 
a black man accused of raping a white woman was a death penalty. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they let one kid off because he was 13 and the rest were sentenced either to long prison terms or to death. Well, they went to the Supreme Court with it and the Supreme Court said because of I think it was the 14th Amendment, but uh, there were no black people on the jury. And in fact, there were no black people on the voter re on the registry to be a juror because they didn't. They took away their voting rights, and so the jury list came from the voters, and so they couldn't possibly get any black people on. And so there was a lot of fraud. So they had three different trials. Every trial went to the Supreme Court. The state Supreme Court said yes, they are guilty, and then they went to the national Supreme Court and said no, you can't do that, uh, even in those days. And so. Uh, to kill, a mock, to, uh, kill a Mockingbird, that book, a lot of it was based on this court case mm -hmm. and the, the premise of it and of a white man uh, defending a black man accused of raping a white woman and this sort of thing. So, uh, but anyway, this, this Lead Belly in his song, he said, you're coming to Alabama, you need to stay woke, meaning you need to be alert. Right. And that's what it was, what uh, the meaning was, is uh, you'd be alert to Rachel racial prejudice and discrimination. And uh, in the song, uh, he warns the colored people to watch out if they went to Alabama. In other words, stay woke, saying the man going to get you. The term has gained popularity among the, the, uh, the, the left, and uh, you call it right-wing politics of Donald Trump. But according to uh, Perry Bacon Jr., ideas that have come to be associated with wokeness include a rejection of American exceptionalism, a belief that the United States has never been a true democracy, that people of color suffer from sy systemic and institutional racism, that white Americans experience white privilege, that African Americans deserve reparations for slavery and post-enslavement discrimination, that disparities among racial groups, for instance, in certain professions or industries are automatic evidence of discrimination, uh, that U.S. law enforcement agencies are designed to discriminate against people of color and so should be disfund defunded, disbanded, or heavily reformed, and that women also suffer from sys systemic sexism, uh, that individuals should be able to identify with any gender or none, that U.S. capitalism is deeply flawed, and that Trump's election to the presidency was a reflection of the prejudices about people of color held by large uh, numbers of people in the United States. And so uh, this is, this paragraph is what they're yelling about in Florida. That that's what they think it means when in reality the term itself means stay aware, stay aware, you know, know what's going on around mm -hmm. you and uh, be ready because uh, the man's going to get you. And so what it seems like to me is that uh, the political people need something to hang their hat on and need something to yell about. And so this is kind of what uh, DeSantos has chosen, that we are going to fight these ideas that uh, America is not the most wonderful place in the world. And uh, I would, I think America is a great place and maybe is the most wonderful place in the world, but it doesn't mean that we haven't done things wrong or we haven't done things badly and that uh, we couldn't be doing things better. Right. And so... Uh, if you don't think Americans, white Americans, have treated people badly, black people and Indians and women, uh, get some books and read. There's all kinds of books written on this stuff, and uh, uh, it's very disheartening. Uh, I just finished a book where uh, the Osage Indians were pushed and pulled, and all their land was stolen from them until finally they just had this rocky, uh, small rocky area in Oklahoma, and then they discovered oil. Uh, and so the Osage Indians were the richest Indian tribe in the world, and they were all driving brand new cars and building big houses and this sort of thing. And uh, then they slowly but surely started being murdered. And there was a, a, a plot among a lot of people to uh, uh, marry into the tribe and then kill people off and then end up with those ownership rights and those millions and millions of dollars. And so, uh, you know, those kind of things happened. They're part of our history, and uh, I feel bad about them, but, you know, I didn't do it. Yep. Uh, but I think we need to recognize that uh, everything we did was not kosher, that was not all good, and that uh, we uh, could very well reform ourselves still.
to this day. So anyway, to me, woke, all woke means is to be aware, and I don't care what uh, the politicians say. I'm not afraid of these other things. Uh, if they come out, they come out, and uh, we'll deal with them. But uh, to me, it's just uh, a lot of people, especially people of color, I think you need to be aware of what's going on around you. And it's too bad, uh, but uh, and actually, we probably need to be aware, too, of what's going on in our government mm -hmm. and keep track of those kinds of things because uh, uh, it's a very fragile thing, democracy, and right. very easily lost. And so uh, that'd be a shame. So anyway, that's what I was thinking about. So. Well, thank you, Dale. I, I, I've read that book as well about the Osage Indians okay. and, and the poisoning. Yeah. They, they were poisoning them with uh, illegal alcohol, I believe. Yeah, well, they put strychnine in illegal alcohol. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in one place, they just put five pounds of nitroglycerin under the house and blew it up. Yep. And uh, they got rid of two relatives at one time there. Yeah, and this, that, guy, this guy, he had his nephew marry into the family. He had children with the woman, and then he's killing the family mm -hmm. so that the, the son would, the nephew would be the only one left and then he would inherit the money which the uncle of course would control. Right. So, uh, and that one case, it was the first real big case the FBI got into when J. Edgar Hoover got started but, uh, and yet the guy said as his research went on, he said there may have been over 600 murders like that in the Osage Nation were different people. It was quite common for people to work their way into the into the families and then try to get rid of them so they could inherit the money. So uh, it's a, a very uh, uh, widespread, and I think it was a conspiracy. I think you're all doing it individually, but it was a common thing to try to cheat the Osage Indians out of their their inheritance or their money just because they were Indians. It didn't matter. You know? Yeah. So the yeah you know, that that is a great story. The Speaking of stories, I got a phone call from former guest and also listener <clears throat> Kara Masteller this past week. And Kara is working um, close to Beverly Hills and close to Hollywood mm -hmm. and the like. And she has a job where she is a caregiver that goes into a home. Mm -hmm. And she goes into this this home that is this 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 family lived right across the street from where Harry Houdini's wife retired. Oh, okay. And his parents used to tell him stories about how Mrs. Houdini would have family friends over, and they would do seances outside on their patio mm -hmm. in front of the neighbors. She um, knew what to say, to, you know, that you were interested in this, didn't she? Yes, mean, it's nice, yes, yeah. Yeah. She pays attention. That's great. Yes. So, so remember, this is the Steve Brown Arts Center Podcast Network. We are 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we are sponsoring the Watermelon Days, but we have several other sponsors Going with us this week, the Littleton Lounge, LLC, Reyes Concrete, Littleton Chatham Historical Society, Jacobson Fabrication and Repair, Dream Chaser Acres, Boyd's Food Truck, and Laces. Forgive me, Laces, I owe you an apology. Your, your name was not put in the ad in the newspaper wow. these last two weeks. Forgive me, that is my fault. The Jessup Lions Club, Independence High School, FFA, Thomas James, LLC, Totally Rolled Ice Cream of Northeast Iowa, Even Events and Rental, LLC, Derek's Repair Shop, LLC, and the Independence Bulletin Journal, and new, ad, new advertiser this week, thank you to Keith Bickard, who donated money for the watermelons well, this good week. For him. So thank you, Keith, yeah. very much. Yeah. If you would like to donate to the Steve Brown Arts Center or have an idea for an event, go to the stevebrownartscenter.org and follow the link. If you have news or would like to sponsor us, email us at jim at stevebrownartscenter.org or call 319-290-0241 and leave a message. I'm Jim Gillespie. Thanks to co-host Dale Reber. 
Our producer, Blake Tempest, and Kelly Seahaas at Cowork 591 Studios. Kelly, you, you are amazing. Thanks to the audience for bringing these stray dogs into your home every week. Remember, each day is about little victories. <laughs>